All right, here we are, short story long. We have a very, very, very special guest today. Uh, that's three varies. That's that's how you know it's very important. <laughs> the shark, Damon John. Hey, welcome, man. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks Appreciate for doing it. this. This is huge. Um, so I don't know how much you know about the podcast here, but what I like to do is go through people's stories. Obviously, you have an insane story. You've written books about it. You've talked about it a lot. It's out there, but um, you created one of the biggest fashion empires in the world. Um, and now you're an incredibly recognizable guy. Everyone's seen you. You're a household name, I would say. Um, the question is, where did it all start? Where did you grow up? Where were you born? Um, thank you. Thank you for the great intro yeah. and um, for positioning that way. Of course, I think that a lot of people, um, you know, take themselves too serious. I think that FUBU had become a really recognizable brand and, and thank you. But Again, you know, you know in the business, um, you know, there are brands out there who do, uh, you know, $3 billion a year to yeah. $18 billion a year. So I would always say that it got to be um, definitely a notable brand, one of the most notable brands in the world, um, not one of the largest, of yeah. course. But, yeah. you know, I, I guess that's because we're, we're yeah. in the business. Yeah. But um, I you, would just, for the argument, large in the case of everybody on earth knows what FUBU is. Like the brand, Most people, yes, is, yes. right? Not the re not necessarily revenue, yeah. But yeah. the brand Fubu. I mean, I understand yeah. you're a humble guy, yeah. and that's great. I'm glad that you didn't just say, "Yep, biggest ever." Thanks, bro. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, damn it, man, that's cool. Well, thank you, man. Yeah. Um, and you know where to start. Um, you know, and I want to make sure that you know when I came on here, I was trying to think of uh, ways to position and tell parts of my story that I haven't told before, because obviously. You know, that's why what you do is so great that, that people want to go out and not give you the sound bites. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, it, it came from and if I'm just going to try to make it, uh, you know, interesting story it came from the time when um, hip hop was, you know, something that I was living when I was when I was nine, 10, 11 years old. I remember the first time I saw somebody scratch a record. I didn't even understand what it was. And it just fascinated me. And in that time, breakdancing. Uh, one of the one of the main components of hip hop, MC and break dancing graffiti, was uh, was something that I wanted to be. I wanted to be a break dancer. And when being a break dancer, what you would do is you would have to take your clothes and you would have to make them uh, functional for hip hop. So if you were somebody who was up rocking in or doing windmills or popping, you would most likely get uh, laces and cross them all the way up your legs up to your knees so that your pants wouldn't hit. Uh, each other because pants were either bell bottoms those days or they were loose. Yep. Uh, you would go and you would take your sneakers and you would you would make the laces, you would wet them and 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 um, iron them to create them fat, so that first of all it gave a great aesthetic to it, but as well as it was fat enough where the laces themselves you didn't have to tie them at the top and it would hold your sneakers on, but you needed all to be able to flip your sneakers off if you wanted to, you know, whether you were yeah. uh, doing those things. So I, we started to to th that started to grow. We started to do stuff like putting um, um, permanent um, creases in our jeans, and we'd have to stitch them. And I didn't have enough money to go and have a tailor stitch this permanent line down in my jeans. So I started to design most of my clothes in whatever ways I could, whether it was dyeing my pumas certain colors that I could, whether it was going to the store and getting belt buckles made and or getting these shirts where you printed on the letters of who you were. You're, of course, you had to put your Zodiac sign on. That was a must, <laughs> yeah, right? That's funny. And then your DJ name. I think I was Kid Express. I think uh, something nice. like that. Yeah. I'm a little day day now. It's turned, <laughs> right? It's evolved. Yeah, it's evolved. It's evolved. <laughs> a lot of love. But um, I did that for quite some time. Um, and I loved hip hop. And I, I did tell a story one place that I went and I finally almost got on tour as a dancer for Houdini. My mother said... Are you out of your fucking mind? You're not going on tour. You're 12 years old, asshole. Go back to school. So I went back to school. Yeah. yeah. And then some kids this with these juicy, juicy jerry curls named um, Jermaine Dupree out of Atlanta. I heard of him. Took my position on that tour. I remember oh, that. Man. Still kind of angry about that. Jermaine. Jermaine. Come on, man. And <laughs> then I went to just enjoying hip hop and living a life of just enjoying hip hop. Now. Fast forward, that was 12, when I was 12, 11, 12, 13. Fast forward to when I was about 19, 20 years old, all of a sudden I started to, you know, still have this love for hip hop, but, you know, it had grown at that point where we were all wearing Timberlands and, and all these kind of filas and all these other brands. They started, you know, saying that they don't make things for people who are rappers, but yet they were making a lot of money. 
And I started to say, I want to make this myself. I never realized that my love and passion for hip hop and my ability to sew could be coupled together. Yep. I just never realized that. At 12, I didn't want to be a designer. Yep. At 12, I wanted to be a rapper, but I couldn't rap. Yep. Same here. So I didn't ever realize it until all of a sudden, bang, it hit me. And I remember walking into a store called Montego Bay one day, and I saw this, uh, this hang tag hanging off the shirt. And this kid looked like a young Mike Tyson with some overalls on, sitting on a railroad, and his name railroad tracks. The name was Carl Kanai. Yep. And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Wait a minute, why are we waiting and depending on other people in other countries because they got funny accents and they're yep. a tailor? Yep. Why are we waiting for them to make it for us? Why can't I just do it for myself? Yep. And and that's how the concept and the theory of of where I am today. That's where it all started. Huge. Can I ask you a question? Uh, can you sort of paint for me what li what neighborhood are you from again? I'm from Hollis, Queens. Got it. So what does life look like in Queens from, I would say, you know, the, the age of, we'll say, 10 to 18? Like, um, you're going to high school, obviously, right? Yeah, so Hollis, Queens is probably one of the most fascinating places in the world in regards to what it looked like at those dates. Yeah. Middle class, working area, it was heavily white at, at one point in the 70s, and then the middle class uh, African Americans and, and a lot of um, Caribbeans moved into that area, and it's an area in Queens that is located right in between JFK, LaGuardia, Aqueduct Racetrack, and Belmont Racetrack, mm -hmm. so most of the people, if we didn't work at Ideal Toy Factory over there, if we didn't work at the racetrack, or we didn't work at the airport, we were either s visiting or living in Rikers Island because that was right next to all of us. So that was yep. where it was. Yep. At that time of growing up, um, the neighborhood in 1984 and 1985 got split right in half. Half of this, this new, uh, very cheap drug named crack came into the neighborhood, and some of the biggest drug dealers in the world exist, or the most notable ones in, in America, were there. Um, and half my friends went to them. It, it got so bad that that was the first actual assassination of a cop who was guarding somebody in a crack case, uh, and President Reagan uh, addressed the drug dealers that were in my neighborhood, and later on you would hear about them, Kenneth Supreme, Griffin, Black Cat, and all these type of people. Yep. Simultaneously, there was another man who grew up there named Russell Simmons, who was also now, he was managing Curtis Blow, and he decided to come out with a record label named Def Jam. So in the middle of that community, you have some of the most notable and most vicious drug dealers in the country, and everybody's going there. And then you have a guy named Russell Simmons who is now putting on Run DMC, Salt and Pepper, LL Cool J, Tribe Called Quest, and then everybody else came from the same exact neighborhood. Ja Rule lived down the block, DJ Clue, 50 Cents, uh, uh, Mr. Cheeks, and Lost Boys. So now you have this neighborhood split in half. Half of us are drug dealers, half of us see an exit out. That's so it was insane. really fascinating, fascinating, fascinating place to grow up in. That is insane. I just, the way that that worked and like the amount of things that came out of that small area. I mean, how yeah. big is the area? Three miles. It's insane. Um, Maybe okay. two and a half. So <laughs> yeah, that's just, yeah. yeah about three I, miles just, I just want to make sure I got that across because that's just yeah. crazy. Um, so you go, you realize that you said roughly 19 is when it started hitting you like, oh, this is something I might be able to do myself one day or? Yeah, well, well, I'll, I'll tell you what really happened was that my friends, uh, the movie High, well, High Williams is from my neighborhood as well as my friend Irv Gotti. Yep. Um, high, uh, my friends, all of our friends were the guys that Hype made the movie Belly about. Yep. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, I used to hang out with those guys. I didn't sell drugs. I didn't do that at all. Every time they were going to go and, you know, move some some drugs i would say you know let me get out the car or whatever cases and they would just let me get out they was my boys because i knew them since we were like maybe in first or second grade can i ask you a quick sorry to interrupt yeah why do you think you had that instinct do you know did your mom give it to you like why how come you didn't get caught up in it well i didn't get caught up in it. you know what i think that i've always been a stats person i looked at the numbers no yeah. matter what when i was a kid i looked at the numbers i used to say to myself well, let me get this straight. If I work at McDonald's and I make $5 an hour and end of the year I'd make whatever, $25,000, but I have insurance and everything else. Yep. My friend over here, he's making about a million dollars a year. Yep. But he's also going away for four years and, you know, for jail. And he always has to look over his back and he doesn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And it really equates to almost the same thing after four years. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 
Um, and I, used to, I just, I, don't I, know. I just said it didn't matter. And then I looked at myself and I said, I'm five, three, really, really cute. I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just not going to work out right. Good instinct. Yeah. yeah. Cause I either got to go hard. I mean, I got to go hard. I got to like, I got to, I got to body a lot of people to get respect at five, three. Yeah. That's usually those it's kind of cats tough. in jail. Yeah. And then I'm going to be there for the rest of my life. Damn so it's not going to be an easy road no matter what. You're right. All right. Damn it. The self-awareness. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Okay, so sorry. So the question was, at 19... So at 19, here's yeah, what happened. Yeah. I looked at the stats again. All my friends who kept going away saying, one more trip, one more trip, they were in jail for 10, 20, 30 years. I said to myself, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something I like. And I didn't create FUBU as a business. I created it as just purely a hobby, and I wanted to dress people. I wanted to make clothes for myself. So I established that I knew I was going to be a waiter for a while in Red Lobster. Uh, I was going to save up some money. I didn't want to take the job home with me every single night because prior to that, I had a couple little, uh, like a, a, a van business, mm -hmm. driving a van. Mm -hmm. I'd always have to worry about insurance and taxes and da da da. Yep. Just wanted to chill out. And I started doing food as a hobby. My friends, they didn't stop talking to me because they always knew, you know, they were cool with me, but they laughed at me. Mm -hmm. At that time, you know, being somebody in fashion was perceived as being somebody who was gay. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys were. Gang banging a drug deal, and then yep. the last thing you know, I'm up there going, "Yo, yo, I gotta go." This sew. hat, this hat would look great with that outfit, <laughs> homeboy. You know what I mean? They would. <laughs> yo, drop me off. I got some yeah, shit to yeah, sew is tonight. That Fuchsia? <laughs> yeah. You know, like they, they were like, "Yo, D, what's going on, man?" You know. So, yeah. um, so it. anyway, so that's when I started, man. Yeah. And it was, but but I I started, you know, I started really seeing. First of all, I started seeing people excited about it. I got excited about it. Yep. And then I started finding a real reason to go on to the to the video sets and holler at the chicks because I was actually there selling That's clothes. Huge. Then yep. I started going on to the, the trade show, not the trade show, uh, the, um, uh, what was it called, Black Expo, the little the little con conventions. Yep. And I had reasons to walk up to girls. Yeah. Ah, uh, now. And now, now it's over. It. Now it's a wrap. And you talk about fuchsia to a pack of girls. Yeah. And it yeah, all flipped. It was, it was great. Yeah. Um, so only because we're short on time, I'm yeah. going to speed through it a little bit. But I guess my question is like, so you started this thing in Queens. I'm guessing you started handing it out to all your boys, sort of showing the culture in Queens. That was probably a, the original vision, right? Like this is for the hip hop, sort of what I'm into. I started off with a tie top hat that you saw in a, maybe in a De La Soul video. I saw in the corner, I just kept selling them. I just kept selling the hats. Kept coming back selling the hats. Kept coming back selling shirts. What I started to notice, I had to close the business down three times from 89 to 92 because I kept running out of money. Mm -hmm. But I would only run out of 1000 2000 $5,000. But every time I see somebody in the shirt, they would say, man, I've been looking for you. How come you aren't on this corner anymore? And I used to go, all right. And then after I hear that 10, 20 times, I get back out on the corner. Yep. And that's how I started to scale like that. Yep. Uh, then after I moved it from there and I went and moved it into stores, I'd go to the stores and I'd say, here's 10 shirts. I can give it to you on consignment. The stores, it was the best interest of them because now they didn't have to pay for them. Yep. And it was the best interest of me because they wouldn't have paid for them anyway. Now they start to move in the stores. Yep. Yep. I keep doubling down on that, doubling down on that. And... And that, and you know, and I'm I'm just trying to make it as fast as possible because this this time we can get to how how it started to scale. Yeah. Uh, I got to that point where I started creating a buzz. This buzz that started in '89, I started to really get traction by '95, '96. Yep. This yep. didn't happen overnight. So all those people that think what oh, we do happens always, overnight, of course, it's crazy. Yep. I uh, start putting in the videos. The same ten shirts I keep putting in videos and taking off and putting on another person and another person. I put it in videos as long as I can for two years. Uh, Method Man wears it, me wears it in my hat and ice cream video, and uh, uh, Old Dirty Bastard wears it in the Mariah Carey video, and uh, Miss Jones wears it in a couple of videos. Brand Nubian wears it. It starts to get a lot of placement in the videos. Yeah. I then I then tell everybody I'm going out to the magic show. I find out all the stores that are going to the magic show and I hit all the specialty stores with a, a, a handwritten note uh, that I'm going to be at the magic show with a picture of LL Cool J yeah. on it. And I caught him outside of his house just wearing a shirt. <laughs> yeah. Now I go to the magic show, write $300,000 in orders, come back home, no bank could finance me because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Turn my house into a factory, get a $100,000 loan on my house. I always joke, but I don't know how. My mother said the house was worth seventy five thousand. Still haven't asked her what she did for the rest of the money. <laughs> um, my friends move out. I mean, my mother moves out. My friends move in. There was nothing like called Alibaba at the time. I didn't want to raise, uh, risk a hundred thousand dollars with a bunch of strangers overseas. Yeah. I put a bunch of uh, sewing machines in there in my house. Sleep on the floor next to the sewing machines. Hire a bunch of seamstresses, and we have a factory in Queens. And then people start to find out about how good we're doing. We run out of money. 
Yeah. Now we're at 96, in year 96. Yeah. Run out of money. I'm about to lose the house. My mother tells me to take an ad in the newspaper, like a Kickstarter, mm -hmm. right? Because there's yeah. nothing new and in this world again. It's funny how it's, yeah, damn it. Same shit. It's a remake. Take an ad in the newspaper saying we need, uh, oh, it said a million dollars in orders, need financing. 33 people called. One of them was Samsung's textile division. The rest of it is history. Insane. Yeah. Damn it. And what a good job is just really breaking that down in like two minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah. I can talk. I'm over I here like I'm on a roller coaster. I'm like, yeah. oh shit, what? And then what? Yeah. Um, was there one moment where you were like, holy shit, like this is it, right? Wh meaning whether it was when you first went into, let's say, Macy's or it's when you first saw it in this video or was there ever that one moment that you remember that was like, oh man, like this. There were hundreds of those one moments and I see that often a Shark Tank because you don't know what you don't know and you think that when you get to this, sta this stage, then all of a sudden it's it's easy going and then you realize, wait a minute, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Um, but, but also, but you have to celebrate those moments and those moments, every one of them was a different moment. You know, it was, you know, when I first saw my my first screen printed shirt come back right or the first embroidery yeah. shirt come back right the first time I got some accessories actually molds being made when anyway. I finally got to magic the first order I ever got from Dr. Jace wait a minute an order from Macy's are you kidding me first time I ever uh, shipped the goods first time I ever took an ad in the Write On magazine or Blackbeat magazine I don't even know if they're still around again yeah. first time I went downstairs and, and, and looked in the answering machine have 47 messages on it and they were people who wanted to order yeah. you know clothes so those moments always happen. I mean, you know, I um, first time we took our office in the Empire State Building, or the first time I was back in, first time my clothes were in Macy's windows. The first time I physically was in Macy's windows. You yeah, know, yeah. first time we got a distribution call from overseas. Um, but all the, at the same time, there were also those times that punched the wind out of me. Yeah, that's right? what I was gonna ask. Exactly, like, is it right? equal? You know, it, it's just as many the of those the times. Low, the yeah. first time that I got a bunch of returns. The first time somebody said that, that stuff is not selling. The first time they said somebody's knocking you off. You mm -hmm. know, the first time they said they don't want your brand. The first time somebody put out a rumor that our brand was sold and people started to listen to it. You know, yeah. um, you know, the first time that we did make inferior goods. Yeah. The first time we got beside ourselves and yeah. somebody said, you're feeling yourself. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. You know, the first time we had a fight because money was around and egos were in place. And the first time that, uh, you know, I, 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 I had to be told, you know, uh, you're not as good as you think. Yeah. You know, you got bit by, you, yeah. you know, you, you, you bit the apple it. one time yeah. or, you know, you got hit by lightning. You're never going to be anything else after that. You one hit wonder. Ah, shit. So many times. Yep. Damn it. What was the peak? What was the high, uh, the highest revenue year and or valuation? Or I, I read a bunch of numbers. The highest, just... the highest uh, the, uh, number that we would hit would probably be about 375. And the way that's broken down is men's topped out around 150 million that year. Um, ladies would then, and, and then we were licensing, so ladies would top out at about 75, and then you would add boots, bags, boys, uh, you know, uh, international distribution, everything else, and it would come together at uh, 350, 400. So when people hear you're doing that a number, it's all, it's all divisions yeah. at once. And that's a wholesale number. Some people fluff it and you know and say you know X amount of retail. So yep. if you want to say retail, sure. then you obviously that's cheating. But you <laughs> yeah. would say yeah, yeah, you would say seven hundred and fifty yeah. million, and that would be retail. That's, that's good bullshit. for press, though. I, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's good <laughs> um, that's insane. I don't think like I have an argument that for a brand like mine or for Fubu or for any of those, I I think that that number is no longer reachable. I agree. I think for H and M, for Top Shop, for Zara, it is. But I think for a brand, I don't know, I, I, for a lifestyle brand, maybe that's not how, how you would differentiate it. Well, you know, I think that um, I'm for the most part I agree, right? So if it's not a sports brand or something that has a massive amount of distribution, like an H and M and those type of brands, yeah, very challenging. But I say that, and then I turn around and I see, you know, uh, five four or yeah. some some of the, obviously our buddies out there yeah. who are, you know, selling direct to customers and memberships. I think that that as we get uh, tighter and tighter with our communication, and I think there are brands that could scale like that. Yeah. Um, I just think, like, man, very, that very era of that, like very challenging to be like, like, like that time. You I know? just can't it's imagine special time. being you on the three hundred fifty million revenue year. Like you, I mean, that's like that feeling. 
Yeah. That's like signing a record deal, winning the lottery, yeah. being in the hottest movie all at once. It is. It is. It is. It's very dangerous to yeah. give a thirty-year-old dude a three hundred fifty million dollar company um, yeah. who never experienced any kind of, um, you know, wealth. Yeah. acknowledgement and or business like that yeah. at that point very very dangerous <laughs> i mean the fact that you're sitting here in a suit yeah still successful the fact that i'm alive you beat the uh, still, yeah multiple times yeah yeah exactly um okay so let's jump over to shark tank so this idea for shark tank comes up did they call you one day and say hey we think you'd be good for this they call me um i never checked my phone uh at the office at that time you know at that time we had um uh, what's it called record um well, Oh yeah, oh, oh that old thing. Yeah, and someone is like, yeah, Mark Burnett called, and I usually and I usually always get. I mean, I I usually have 150 messages. And it's usually like, hey, you're looking for a new um, you're looking for a new office space, or hey, yeah. I would love to manage your money. You know what I mean? Or all, all all that kind of stuff like that. And I said, Mark Burnett called. I said, nah, I'll call him back. And um, uh, we called him back, and uh, a guy named Clay, uh, is, it was from Mark Burnett's office, a guy named Clay, who's actually the executive producer of the show, yeah. uh, got on the phone, and we then got into a Skype, um, and he had a room full of people in his in his, in the Skype, and I had a room, me and me, two of my other people uh -huh. were in my room, and he told me about this idea of Shark Tank, and I said he was crazy. Really? I said, and then he told me who was going to be on the show, and he said, we can't say many names, but you know, one guy we're thinking about named Mark Cuban is going to be on, and I was like... I'm like, you're so full of shit. I was like, you know, you, I was like, the dude, Mark Cuban, the dude who has, you know, more money than God, number one. So he's going to be looking for all these little investments. Mark Cuban is going to, and he's on TV. Yeah. I said, you're full of shit. This is, this is, you, you Hollywood guys are just liars. I said, no, nah, I don't, I'm not interested. Um, and then, um, you know, he, he called back and I said, all right, here's the deal. Cause, cause I also thought not only that he's full of shit, but that the, 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 the product, the, the show wouldn't work. Who wants to see five business men and women just talk, do what we do every day? 100%. Right? Yep. I said, here's the deal. I'm, I need to be able to pitch Mark Burnett on these three smoking new TV ideas. Yeah. If I can, I'll come out there and I'll shoot that show. Yep. I was thinking free, free trip to California. Yeah, like that stupid little show. Hollywood. I'm going to get mine in there. Yeah, so I go out there, <laughs> I, I shoot the show, whatever. I pitch Mark my three ideas. I mean, we were at breakfast before the eggs even got to us. He shot all the ideas down because they were crappy, and I agree now, knowing really? what the ideas were. Okay. Shark Tank takes off. Weird how that works, huh? That Just like how, like, you know, one day, I mean, we all think we're pretty smart guys. Yeah. And one day you're like, this one's shit. I have three hot, hot yeah, ideas. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And then, like, here we are, and that thing's like a household hit. It's a, it's a. And it's like, you're now like, ah, oh, those ideas were kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank God I, but thank God I took that, uh, you know, that, that meeting. You yeah, know? there's a huge lesson in that. So, what's that? I mean, has that been crazy? Uh, I mean, you sit there, you hear all these pitches. It's, it's real. I mean, there yeah. really are these people coming on there, giving yeah. their life. Yeah. They're scared to death. Yeah. You guys are so scary to them. Yeah, uh, you get to hear everyone's idea and how they go about it. Has it changed your opinion of entrepreneurship? Has it opened your eyes? Has it like what has it done for you personally? I mean, you know, going on my ninth year with this show, it is, it has made me. Um, it's helped me grow a lot. It has changed me. It, I, the education. I'm the luckiest person in the world being on the show because even though I joke about the other sharks that they're idiots and morons, I I'm joking because I learn from them. Yeah. And I learned from the people who are pitching. And I've learned so much. I've learned the value of entrepreneurship. Yeah. I've learned who entrepreneurs are. I've learned who entrepreneurs are. Yeah. You know, I've learned a total new way of doing business. Um, you know, if I wasn't on that show, I'd be doing the same old crap that all my colleagues are doing. Let's make a shirt. Maybe a buyer will buy it. Maybe they'll yeah. put it up on a rack at some store. We don't even know what store. And somebody will buy it. Yeah. I'm not sure who bought it at the store. Yeah. When I see the... The, the the bombers of the world, the five fours of the world, all these people who are doing 10, 20, 100, 200 million dollars, no retail, straight to customers, yep. understanding how they're breaking it down and how they're upselling their customer, how they're getting the identity of their customer, social media conversion, all this type of stuff, no inventory, you know, shipping within 10 days, you know, it's it's night and day yeah. from where I started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also understanding the value of entrepreneurship, how around the world it's valuable, how, uh, you know, whether it's a crip or a blood or somebody in, uh, you know, Africa who's picking up a gun because they can't feed their family and somebody's saying, hey, 
here's a couple of dollars. If you go do this, yep. then I'm going to give you a couple of dollars to feed your family. When I realize now that if they can open their cell phone and make five or $5,000, they're not going to pick up a gun. They're not going to go and hurt anybody because who wants to go do that? Yeah. Right and entrepreneurship, they're going to go employ people instead of being a liability in our community. They're going to be a taxpayer. They're going to be a mentor. They're going to be a father, a mother. Yeah. So when I realized the power of it, I never realized the power of it. You know, um, it's, it's just, been life changing. It's how do you get the childhood you, yeah, who was going to stay in the car, to get out of the car when you get out and yeah. to go try to sell some legal stuff on the corner. It's like how could you break it down to that? I, I think you like, just you summed could, it up. That, uh, that, if you could do that, man. That's why I do the podcast. That's why I do a lot of what I do now. Yeah. My eyes have been a little bit more open mm -hmm. to um, to that stuff. But it's like, man, it's that. It's get out of the car. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think in that, and that's it, right? Our customers for uh, who our viewers for podcast, I mean, for Shark Tank or, or like the people who listen to you, yeah. they're seeking the truth. Right, you know, because the, the theory of a rumor can be spread 10 times faster than the truth is real. And those out there who are just listening to music and watching things that uh, people put up on Instagram because all of a sudden I'm rich on Instagram, yeah. and you know they're not. Yeah. Those people are not seeking the truth because they're, 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 they're painting their world full of you're insecure and there's shortcuts to do this. But people like who listen to obviously this podcast and watch Shark Tank, they, they want more knowledge. On how to get out of the car yeah and what is the reason to get out of the car hey you guys are taking a ride the wrong places and and stats have shown it's not going to end up right mm -hmm. nine out of ten i'm not going to end up right but you know what if i bust my ass and get out of the car yeah five out of ten end up really good yeah and we're not talking about money necessarily because successful people don't all make money yeah but even if you today and this whole time we're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year legally you'd have a yeah. great life of course. You know what I mean? And I'm saying way better Absolutely. than all the other options. And the chances of that by just getting out of the car and working are pretty good. 100%. But you can make that happen. 100%. You know, and a lot of people listening to this, you know, and I know they know it, but a lot of times they, they don't realize it. But success is not money. Yeah. You know, because there's a lot of wealthy people that drive up to their problems, you know, just yeah. in a Ferrari. Yeah. Right? But a lot of times success is those people that we know that are, you know, um, they're teachers, right? Or they're 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 in the core. They're going out and they're 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 fighting for other people. Mm -hmm. Or they're nurses, you know. Mm -hmm. Or they're veterans, right? Mm -hmm. They're successful. Yep. Right. They, you know, they don't want a lot of people we know don't want money. Yeah. You know. Yep. So anyway, it's getting out of the car to do something that's in the best interest of yourself and others. Yeah. That that's always the best. I love it, man. Um, okay, a little bit into the fun stuff now because we're almost uh, up on time. Is my biggest question is, you built so at thirty years old you're have this massive bus business doing insane amounts of business i'm sure have a lot to deal with right like yeah. working really incredibly hard yeah um since then you've now went on you've now done a tv show you're doing all this stuff my question is how has your sort of routine and self-management changed from now as an adult uh, who's refined and who's been successful for a long time to sort of when you were just running and gunning in the early stages of FUBU? Yeah, so I think the early stages of FUBU, it was about world domination. It was how can we grow so big because it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. right? How can I employ more people? How can this month, instead of shipping 10 million, we got to ship 15 million? And how next month after that, we got to ship 20 because that's how you scale it incrementally, right? Mm -hmm. Bring on more licenses take on more territories uh, how can i have a bigger imprint in the world and today it's not that and and i noticed when i was doing that it was me not knowing what i don't know and believing that that's what i wanted and growing it but now today knowing that i don't want to staff over 100 people mm -hmm. um i don't need more money and i don't need to be a billionaire mm -hmm. because if i'm going to give it all away when i die anyway what the hell is the use mm -hmm. of having it yeah um, I don't need seven, eight houses because my friends enjoyed my houses more than I did. Yep. So now all of a sudden it becomes, um, what can I do today that I'm extremely excited about and how can my core group of people around me um, be fulfilled and excited too? Because I noticed that a lot of my core people, yes, everybody needs to keep their lights on, but they're doing it for a bigger reason. Mm -hmm. And um, where can I find myself, where can I, where can I go out now and challenge myself, but not a long-term challenge? I want challenges that are uh, tough, but I don't have to pay for, I don't have to pay for it for 20 years. Because mm -hmm. what if I want to get out of it in five, right? Yeah. So I want to 
th that's where it is. It's about balancing my time and inventory and how to be more effective at it and make sure the people around me uh, can be more uh, fulfilled. But I also don't want to take on massive amounts of staff and things of that nature. So yeah. every day I'm trying to trying to fig yeah, figure out. Getting that, that clarity, I just think, is so like, it's something that just happens as you get older. And I think yeah. it's like so valuable because when you're young, um, you want a thousand employees. Yeah. And then you want 2,000 because mm -hmm. you want to literally dominate the world and crush everybody. Yeah, it's it's like, almost it's like saying, like, you know, when I was young, I was like, man, you can see me living with seven women. Yes. yes. You try living with seven women. Try it. it a, Give it a shot. Man, you, and the 2,000 employees and, and 12 houses. Yeah. you don't Manage that you, life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. What... Uh, do you have any morning routines? Do you have any daily? Do you travel a lot? You're all over the place. Like my biggest thing is this: as I get older, I'm I'm the last year or so, I'm really trying to focus on sort of morning routine, meditating, things like that, experimenting with that stuff. But I notice my biggest thing right, mm -hmm. is traveling. Uh, like if I if I'm on a work trip or I'm here for two days or whatever, it just throws me out of my whole routine, um, and messes me up. Do you have anything that you do? Every day, no matter what. Or... Yeah, so it's fascinating that you ask me that because my new book, uh, which is called Rise and Grind, is I've, I've studied now um, probably 15 or even 20 people, such as yourself, mm -hmm. um, uh, Santana, Catherine Zeta-Jones, the guy I met that had has no limbs, and he, um, he army climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. without any prosthetics on, stuff like that. I've, I asked them all the same thing. What do you do the first night? Even da, da, da. Yeah. And I'm, bring, I'm saying that because it brings it back to what I do. Every morning, every night, I read my goals. I have 10 goals that I read, and the goals, six of them expire in six months. Uh, uh, seven expire in six months, excuse me. One ex expires in five years, another in 10, another in 20. The reason I've always done this is the first time I read the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, it told me about goal setting. Yep. After I read that book, within 10 years, I would be uh, a millionaire. It yep. was due to my goal setting. You read that when you were really young? Yeah, when I was, I was, I was, I read that when I was, when I was 17. Nice. Um, and I read the book every year and a half now to reinforce it. Uh, the reason I read the goals at night is because it's the last thing I think about. I start to dream about them. The reason I read them when I wake up is because I take one of those actions, no matter what it is. And, and goals have to be very aggressive. That has to be something like, uh, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get down to, um, I'm 190, I'm going to get down to 170 pounds, uh, by whatever, mm -hmm. July 15th, by drinking 10 glasses of water a day, not eating any fried food, not eating after 8 PM, uh, working out once in the morning, working out once in the evening, like very, very, yeah. you know, very precise. And then goes down to, I'm going to lose one pound and a pound and a half every week until then. Yeah. What, uh, but after doing these interviews, I started to realize there's a lot of things that I did when I was 25 that I no longer do anymore. I now, as of two weeks ago, I started. I, I used to work out at night. Mm -hmm. Why? Gym's empty. Get to clear my head. After a bunch of energy drinks like I drink, I got to mm -hmm. get it out of me. Yep. It makes me rest and relax. Yep. But after doing that, I realized that most of the successful people that I have interviewed, whatever you deem success is, they work out early in the morning. It gets their adrenaline pumping. Yeah. Uh, it gives them more energy. Most of us say we won't have time. But what it did is it creates more time because what happens is you're more productive at work. So if you look at the long haul of it, yeah. that little hour you took there just saved you 10 hours because you were more aggressive at work. Yeah. Uh, it burns uh, your faster, so you lose weight faster, creates more muscle, which burns more than fat earlier on in the day. I started to add that to my routine. It's like I found a whole new Damon. Yeah. And, and you know what? I, I used to do it before. Yeah. But it's we get so uh, accustomed to our routine and forgot what got us here. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those are the one of the things I do now. I notice now, I'm not even, I used to say, oh, I'm going to get away from working. I notice when I'm walking on the treadmill for an hour or running in the park, I'm actually doing more texts and answering more calls. Yeah. And, you know, so um, that's one thing I've realized to do. Uh, of course, my version of setting goals is your version of meditating. Yep. You know, it's coming, it's getting into a dark space and really getting to appreciate all the things that are around you, yep. knowing where you want to go in life and being grateful for the things that are currently there. Yep. Um, so those are two things that I definitely would say to do it. But, you know, in those orders, do it. Do you, I do my version of meditation twice yep. a day and I do that working out early. You do any mindset stuff? Like, do you have any like positivity or gratitude practice or anything like that? That's a new, another thing that I'm like. Well, I do that at night, you know, um, after uh, uh, I set my goals. Oh, no, before, before I set my goals, I pray. And I, you know, and I pray as in, 
you know, I, I, I first look at myself and thank you for myself. And then, then I, I cause a ring around me. Yep. And then I go out to my family. Then I go out to my uh, friends and my health and, you know, and, and the people around me, my staff. And then I go out to the world itself and energy outside. Yeah. Um, but yes, I have, I, I, I set myself like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. I just, that was something that is, like I said, relatively new to me. And like the idea of sort of controlling your, mood even is like yeah. you know what i mean i don't know when you're younger you just go with the flow and today's a shitty day and i'm mad at everyone so fuck everyone you know yeah. what i mean and today i feel like i can kill it so i'm gonna go kill it and like yeah not that you can be superman but no you have to control it though. i mean you know and going with the flow i mean the old saying is the only you know only dead fish go with the flow right yeah damn right. um i've never uh, heard that that's yeah incredible. But, and, and and it's the truth right yeah um i often but that's a practice that i do as well when i find myself depressed or um angry or about to reply to somebody you never reply mm -hmm. you never react you must respond right you have to take a second and say am i reacting yeah. or am i responding yeah. right before you want to cut somebody down right and then also what i do is i ask myself why well, why am i angry mm -hmm. why exactly am i angry? why am i depressed yeah because then you got to get down to the core of it right of why and once you get to why all right let's say i say why because i didn't like the way you were talking to me mm -hmm. you disrespected me then I get down to the core of, well, if everybody, uh, you know, the way we look at everybody, when they do something against you, it's almost like playing a game of chess. You know they're playing and they're moving against you because they want to win. It's what, why do you feel that's going to help you win? Yeah. What did I do to you? You got to get really, you know, and, and it takes some time. Once yeah. you get down to that, though, it saves you time on the back end because you don't get all this bullshit between us. You either yeah. respond accurately, yeah. you brush it off, or something else happens. Yeah, that awareness is life-changing. I wish they taught that in, like, you know. Maybe middle school, high school. How can you teach that to kids? But you, I just wish you could teach All mindset. filled up with adrenaline. You know, I know, I know, but they don't even address it. Puberty. All you do is you get suspended. Oh, you have bad management skills yeah. for yourself, so we're, so go sit a week out and then come back and do it twice as bad. It's just a bad system, right? It is a bad system. You know. Um, okay, last couple is, this is a big one for me uh, that I always ask is, now, it's it's similar to the routine stuff and that stuff, but now everything that you've been through, everything that you've experienced, everything that you've learned, if you could simply speak to uh, 12-year-old Damon right now for mm. two seconds and just give him a little gem that might make life a little bit easier, what would you tell little Damon? Yeah, I'll say little Damon, I would say, hey man, I want you to go out and understand numbers and, and get financial intelligence to have. To have money doesn't really mean anything. It's a tool, right? So you have to learn how to use this tool. Um, also, you know, find like-minded people, mm -hmm. and don't try to impress anybody. They don't care about you at the end of the day. You know, um, you know, really, really be um, one hundred percent um, honest with yourself. Why you're going after something? Mm -hmm. If you're going after it for public perception or something else like that. What's going to happen? You know, like when you get it, what's that going to do for you? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, and you know what? Take care of your health, man. You know, but again, how can you tell that to a 12 year old? Yeah. You know, yeah. when you tell a 12 year old, take care of your health, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? But here's, the, here's my question. Not to get too deep and whatever here, but it's like, is anyone trying? Meaning, are they not listening because they're 12 or are they not listening because they're not taught the same way that they're taught some math class that they couldn't give a shit less about? I think I think it's both yeah. um, because I I, I I turned around when I was uh, maybe 35 years old and I looked back on the history of what I did and my mother was actually right, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's true. But we well, have those moments. Yeah, yeah, 12, 15 years old. I was yeah. like, she's crazy. What's wrong with her? But maybe that's the reason why you got out of the car instead of stayed in. It, that is some right. of the reason. Uh, no, you know what, my mother. No, no, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. My mother was really slick, and she did this whole, you know, uh, what's it called, child psychology on me. Mm -hmm. I well, remember, uh, you reverse know, reverse psychology. Yeah, right? reverse psychology. Yeah. Well, no, child psychology too, because yeah. I was a child. <laughs> well, no, same thing. Uh, I remember <laughs> when um, crack had just came out, and you know, and it wasn't, you know, it, it, you didn't see the effects of how bad it was, mm -hmm. right? But it was supposedly cool. Yep. I remember my mother saying to me, and then then you did start seeing people like, you know stealing shit and stuff like that. I remember yeah. my mother saying, you know what, listen, I know it's tempting to do drugs. I understand. I never did it before myself. But if you want to, why don't you go out and get some crack and come home and we're going to try crack together. And that was instantly not cool. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> she Damn it. What think a... of your mother being a crackhead. Like, well, I don't well, want my mother stealing my television at night. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, 
she ruined the whole thing. It's because of her. She ruined the crack experience for me. Your mom ruined crack for you. Yeah, she ruined crack for me. There's some things you just, you know, that's like telling me Santa Claus ain't real. She ruined crack for me. So she did shit like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, damn it. Yeah. What a bold move that paid off perfectly. Yeah, because what if I'd have came home and be like, yo, like, mom, yo, check mom, your jumbos. Check this shit out. <laughs> yo, pass Let's that pipe. Get it, mom. What if I'd have said that? Yeah. I don't know. But she probably would have had another response to that, oh, you know? Damn it. Um, Okay, last thing, and I'll let you go. What is next? You got a million things going on. You got a book coming out. You got a new season yeah. dropping too. Uh, yeah, new season. Just shot a new season. Have amazing, amazing uh, guest shark Sarah Blakely, who founded Spanx A Rod. You would think, uh, you know, don't ever judge athletes and think they don't have financial intelligence as well as business acumen. He's yeah. in, incredible. Bethany Frankel really impressed me from mm-hmm. the Housewives. A lot of people were questioning, um, you know, should she be on there? But you know what? I don't care what industry you're in. If you uh, get to the top of your industry, you're doing something. Yeah. You have something behind the scenes that is working and or you're thinking about it. Yep. You know, um, uh, 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 Rohan, uh, obviously the guy, well, if you don't know who he is, the guy's been incredible in things like, uh, I think, uh, uh, vitamin water. And I mm-hmm. think he has buy. By, by right now, um, mm-hmm. really amazing guy. Uh, I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, how can I forget? Sir oh, Richard Branson. Man, he's Sir on? Richard Branson. Yeah, Sir Richard Branson wow. on, and he does one of the most uh, um, the craziest things I've ever seen done by a shark in Shark Tank history. Not a deal making, but a, a, a debate against the other sharks. It's, it. I didn't even know they were going to air it. So that's that's how how crazy that is. Um, I'm excited huh? for that. Oh, oh, yeah, no, I did say my twin. I did say A-Rod's on, right, my twin? Yeah, Day-Rod? Yeah, whenever I'm not on, if the guy looks exactly <laughs> like me but with an accent. That's Day-Rod. Yeah, that's me, Day-Rod. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so, so I got that. God damn. I obviously have my, my next book coming out. I, you know, Power Broke really did well, and it, it was the theory that you and I both know. I don't care how much money you have. You have to build a culture of following. Yep. Use your assets to get where you're going because money's not going to get you there. Uh, the biggest mistake I ever made was investing in a company called Heatherette, and I lost $6 million because I thought I could just buy my way uh, you know, into making the company bigger. Yeah. Um, so the next book now is Rise and Grind. It goes into what are the daily habits, the actual recipes and the execution that people, successful people use, and for some people to either learn about these things or remind them of what got them there. So yeah. Rise and Grind is going to come out, and and I'm starting to now put out a, a digital curriculum. Um, it's called Damon on Demand. And unlike when you and I grew up, we had to put CDs or DVDs in to play mm-hmm. it. You know, this thing is eight hours of solutions on how to how to start a business and grow a business. And it's digital and it's interactive. So you hit this thing. If if I'm talking about uh, Instagram and uh, Snapchat today, but tomorrow it's a different uh, platform. Yeah. We'll upload it, and it'll be uploaded just like an app. All these lessons will just keep Huge. growing, keep growing. And, and I put in it what I call $20 million worth of my mistakes. Um, yeah. And a lot of people can get that. Uh, let me, Ted, so they can text the shark to 44222 to learn more about it and to understand it. We're going to give a free subscription. You're going to give a free subscription away. You're going to get one away. Okay. Oh, and um, a couple of people have been scoring, and maybe I, I'll maybe we'll see if we can work it out and give you scoring some yeah. of my speaking engagements. Um, uh-huh. I'm not rapping. Yeah. None, none of the words rhyme. Damn it! I was hoping the album. Yeah, was no coming. hooks. No the album's no, dropping. No, no. We got no, 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 no. I'm old, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is purely scoring uh, for motivation. Because you know, like you hear one of my speeches, or you hear a motivational speech one time. You know, you don't want to work out to the gym and to get it, get you excited. But like, if you hear obviously one of the greatest speeches ever, MLK, Martin Luther King, you hear his speech every Monday, that Monday, and they, they put music underneath it. Yeah. I work out to that. Yeah. Right? So so people have been scoring a lot of my stuff that now is like, whether it's goal setting or whether it's, uh, you know, dealing with haters in your life, you know, yeah. dealing with self-doubt or, you know, hitting a target. So anyway, stuff. got a lot of stuff going on. Huge. And all my companies, all my Shark Tank companies that I'm investing in, and I have the honor to... Uh, to take a ride on with somebody in their dream. Yeah, Those are the ones I'm must be with. hectic, man. I can't imagine what your inbox looks like on a day, on and, a normal day. Well, it's still full. It's it's about <laughs> yeah. it's about four thousand that I don't get to on average. Yeah. 
Um, where do people find, uh, where's the best place to follow you to know when the book's coming out, to know when all this stuff is happening? Yeah, so you can follow me on any of my social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, Instagram and Snapchat, um, The Shark Damon. My name is spelled like Raymond with a D. Uh, the Shark Damon, D-A-Y-M-O-N-D. Done. Thank you so much for squeezing me into your busy no, schedule. Man, thank you, you for having me. You murdered it. I'm, I mean, not surprised. I knew you were going to kill it. <laughs> thank, thank you, man. All right.